This week on The Climate Show with Tom Heap, I'm talking rubbish and about how more of this stuff could be getting into our rivers and seas as a result of climate change. Hello and welcome to The Climate Show. On the programme this week, yep, it's the return of Rubbish Heap. And we're going to be revealing the extraordinary landfills next to the sea that are eroding and dumping this stuff in our waters. In Bosnia, we hear how a warmer than usual winter with heavy rain has led to disaster with river flooding sweeping up tonnes of waste from poorly regulated landfills and dumps. And what does minus 50 degrees feel like? <coughs> the cold just catches in your throat as soon as you're out. Our Asia correspondent, Helen Ann Smith, joins me from China's most northerly city after it experiences its coldest day ever. I'm sitting on top of an old landfill site on the Thames Estuary, and the reason you can see what lies beneath here is that every day the tide and the current wash this stuff away. There are over a thousand coastal landfill sites around the country and many of them are being eroded. So how bad is this for marine life and what can be done to stop it? For as long as humanity has lived by the water, we've dropped stuff in it. The history of our settlement by the Thames and other British tidal rivers is written on the riverbed and Mudlark Monica knows how to read it. Do you have any luck today? I um, found a few bits. My favourite piece is this, which is a docker's hook. So I, I absolutely love that. It's just so much an integral part of London history. You need a licence to scour the tide line here, as the finds can be historic and precious. So what we've got here, all sorts of lovely things. We've got a Georgian buckle. So. That came off a silk shoe because I know I found the sole but no leather and just a buckle on the top. So by the absence of material, we know the silk would have decayed but the shoe wouldn't. I love saving the history of London. This is all like, I'm, I'm a born and bred Londoner, so this is my ancestors. What do you think about the fact that you're finding, you know, now plastic yeah. bits in here? Yeah. Um, I'm gutted for the future, for what, what we leave behind. I think we are better go. <laughs> Further downstream, a few miles east of the M25, and what we've discarded is less like an occasional artefact and more of a crust. It is one of the weirdest coasts I've ever walked on, isn't it? Because when you look in the distance, you think, oh, this is a fairly normal coast, but then as your eyes come down, it's just hideous, isn't it? Yeah, and it's really kind of the layers of plastic and old historical waste that is really the concern. How do you feel when you see places like this? Well, it's, it's a bit devastating, really. And much of it hasn't travelled far. This was a rubbish dump and a landfill site from the Victorian era right up until 1991. In fact, there are thousands of disused landfill sites across the UK, lots of them dotted along our coasts, that were opened before environmental regulations came into force. Many of them are now at risk of coastal erosion. It's really hard to believe this until you've actually been here. It's the way you've got this extraordinary variety of old stuff of ours. This is a bit of tyre. That's elastic, rotting plastic. And the way it's mixed in with the natural world, with all the roots dangling here and the earth, they're almost like geological seams of our waste sins of the past coming through. And it's not just here. There are places similar to this around much of the country. What was buried is returning to haunt us. This is the thing that we're worried about in, in the tidal Thames, is that it's, it can be old plastic that is, that's been here for a very long time, almost been preserved, but now as it starts to come out, starts to be exposed to the, the elements and the river itself, is really when it starts to break down and it, then it can really make its way into really, really small pieces into, they call them uh, microplastics. The worrying thing here, it's not just the plastics, it's also the hazardous chemicals um, that can be a really serious issue for wildlife that, that if we let this out into the river, it could really devastate wildlife here. In a survey out this month, 26 councils admitted they have waste sites already spilling onto beaches and into the sea. 
Just three said they had sufficient funds to protect coastal dumps. In an era of climate change, zombie garbage is awakened. It's a whole complex of things, natural processes <clears throat> which are changed by human intervention. And then, of course, we have got sea level rise, which can be a problem because you end up with, for example, sort of increased storminess or the waves are starting to attack things at a higher level. What, if anything, can we do about these eroding coastal landfill sites? The bottom line is that with some of them, if we want to avoid this stuff just being tipped uncontrollably into the sea, you know, relocation of the material has got to be fairly high on the list of options. But there is little evidence of councils, governments or the waste companies who ran the dumps finding the millions, possibly billions, required to staunch these wellsprings of trash. There's things that we thought were away. We, we, we disposed of them, we gave them to the local authorities, we thought they were gone, they were being, uh, being properly managed. And actually that really wasn't the case. And now it's, it's something that we all have to deal with. In Bosnia this winter they've had a similar problem to this. Unseasonably heavy rain has caused rivers to flood and tear apart many of their landfill sites. Environmentalists are worried about the damage and what to do to clean it up. Plastic bags, bottles and even an old fridge are choking the Drina River. Days of torrential rain and flooding have left this Bosnia-Herzegovina beauty spot crammed with an estimated 10,000 cubic metres of rubbish. Waste from poorly regulated riverside landfills has accumulated behind a barrier in the river and it isn't the first time it's happened. Through no fault of our own, the Visegrad municipality has turned into a regional waste site. The solution exists. We must urgently register all illegal garbage dump sites on the banks of our rivers. This is not just a huge environmental and health hazard, but it's also a big embarrassment for all of us. Like much of Europe, the Balkans have experienced unseasonably warm weather and downpours, causing streams and rivers to overflow. People need to wake up. This is a serious problem. The clean-up of these once pristine waters has begun, but it's thought it could take up to six months. And now for a waste issue a little closer to home. Have you ever noticed those multicoloured bits of plastic, vapes that often gather on the curbside? Well, Laura Young from Dundee has. She goes by the name of the Vape Crusader or Less Waste Laura. My name is Laura Young and I'm campaigning to get single-use disposable vapes banned in the UK. This industry started with reusable models which could be refilled with solutions and recharged when people needed to top them up. Now, single-use disposable models have surged onto the market with over 1.3 million being sold every single week. These devices contain many different materials, including a lithium ion battery. This means that over 1.3 million of these devices, including the battery, are being thrown away because they are branded as disposable every single week, with the majority of them going into landfill and general waste. I often go on walks to see how many I can find, and commonly I find about one every single minute. Where I live in Dundee, I went on an hour's walk and found 55 in that time. This is the latest collection that I have and I need to go and recycle it. One of the problems with recycling these is that it is not available curbside. I have to take it to my local recycling centre, which is over three miles away, and you need to actually book an appointment, a slot, and you need to go in a car. That is me just leaving the recycling centre after disposing of the vapes. One interesting point is that I double checked with the staff at the centre about where I should be putting these. They had never actually been asked where these should go before. No one had brought them in and asked them if they are to be recycled or if they are to go into general waste. They are now actually gonna go and ask their company exactly how these are supposed to be disposed of just to double check and make sure. But it's interesting to know that our waste industry is not 100% sure of where these items are supposed to be disposed of, how these are supposed to be recycled and when we have 1.3 million being used every single week in the UK you can see that this could become a big problem very quickly. It's great to see the progress that the Scottish Government is making. We'll ask stakeholders with the relevant expertise to examine the evidence and assess what action the Scottish Government and other partners should take 
and that will include consideration of a potential ban. I hope that they see that banning is the clear way to move forward alongside greater regulation and I hope this influences the UK government to do more. And Laura sent us a question which we put to Environment Secretary Therese Coffey. She asked, the Scottish Government is urgently considering a ban on disposable single-use vapes. Would you support a ban on these products too? I wasn't aware um, the Scottish Government were considering that. I know that, uh, um, that uh, health professionals consider moving to vaping as a good way to try and reduce uh, smoking, um, but uh, the, any particular aspects of banning is not under consideration. After the break, we'll be off to northern China, which is experiencing record cold temperatures. And also catching up with a bird watcher, a young enthusiast who believes that climate change and the warmer winter weather is confusing some of our native birds. Welcome back to The Climate Show. As you can see, I'm away from the mud banks and in the studio. And it's cosy in here, unlike this place, Moa, in China. It's known as China's North Pole, but this week temperatures plunged to record lows even here, a bone-chilling minus 53 degrees centigrade, the country's coldest day ever, just as China rang in the Lunar New Year. Uh, climate change tends to exaggerate extremes at both ends of the scale, and this comes just months after China's longest heat wave in decades. Temperatures were as high as 45 degrees in Chongqing, a new record outside the desert region of Xinjiang. I caught up with Sky's Asia correspondent Helen Ann Smith from Moha, where she's been reporting this week. Hello, Nan. It's great to see you. I can see your breath and the people behind you. Um, I thought it was cold here next to the Thames. What's it like for you? Well, it is just absolutely freezing. There's no more basic way to put it than that. It's one of those things when you talk about these sort of minus 40s, minus 50s temperatures, you think you might be able to picture what that might feel like and then you get here and then it just hits you like a ton of bricks. It's the sort of cold that kind of catches in your lungs. It makes you want to cough. It literally takes your breath away. And then any bit of moisture on your body has that sort of sensation of kind of freezing up instantly. So your eyelashes, your eyelids, your nostrils. Um, and as a team, we have to be really careful not spending a long amount of period out time, a lot of period out outside and keeping our skin uh, concealed. But this place, I mean, it's used to cold here. This is known as China's North Pole, this village. It is literally the furthest north uh, town and village in the whole country. And just over the river, just over there, over the frozen river is the border with Russia. So this is typically a cold place, but this week it has been historically cold, minus 53 degrees earlier in the week. And that is a new record in the entire, entire modern history of China, according to the meteorological office here. Uh, uh, how unusual is it and are people linking it to climate change? Well, look, this is a cold place typically. Uh, this time of year, it would definitely be in the sort of you know, minus 20 region pretty regularly here. So it's not as if they're not used to the cold here, but uh, just the scale of the cold, that minus 53 that was recorded, that is, as I said, a, a new um, historic milestone broken, actually, their previous record all the way back in 1969. Um, but I spoke to one gentleman, a man called Mr Shear, who runs a, a very small kind of convenience store shop, and he's been talking to me about those extremities of weather that he's noticed. And in the whole life he's spent here, he said... Uh, in recent years, he's noticed those extremes. So look, as you know, Tom, it's not as if we can say that any individual event is absolutely because of climate change without further research. But what we do know about China in particular is that this country just this year has seen these absolute extremes of weather. The summer just gone by, the country recorded historic heat waves, historic droughts. We saw these incredible pictures of great swathes of the, the Yangtze River completely dried up. And the authorities here spoke about just how extreme that heat wave was. And then we compare it now to these historic colds. So 
Climate change, of course, as we know, does play a role in exacerbating these extreme climate events. There's scientific work, for example, linking um, warming seawaters to excessive cold events. So we know some of these changes are happening and the people here say they are worried about it. Uh, but of course, we have to be careful about that individual links. But as I say, Tom, it is quite extraordinary to experience colds of just this degree. Now for a little on what's been making news in climate this week. And for that, I've been catching up Riverside again with our climate reporter, Victoria Seabrook. Victoria, last time we met was at the big climate summit in Egypt. Here we are on the banks of the Thames, but talking again about these COP summits, because a lot of arguments about the president of the new COP, um, this guy who runs the Abu Dhabi National Oil Company, who's going to be chairing the meeting. Seems bizarre. Yes, there's been a lot of hoo-ha about it this week, again. Uh, so he is a government minister, but he also heads up this huge oil company, Sultan al Jaber, and campaigners have condemned the appointment. They've said that this big international climate diplomacy process that agrees the collective global next steps on climate change is, cannot be legitimate if you've got the head of an oil company presiding over it. That's what they say. There is another view of him, but just before we get there, what does a president of a COP summit actually do? What's his influence? His influence is huge. So the role of the host nation is to drive the talks in a particular direction, to seek consensus, to hold laggard governments to account. And at the, at the he very forefront of that process is the single appointed COP president. In effect, he's setting the agenda, so I can decide what's on it and what's off it. Yes, and there's a lot of concern that if he's the head of an oil company, does he and does the UAE have a vested interest in maintaining the status quo? They've also got a very good relationship with other oil producing nations like Saudi Arabia, which is not renowned for its ambition at these kind of summits. Not. But you've heard from some people who actually are welcoming the appointment, some of them with, with pretty strong green credentials as well. Yes, yeah, so this week I was at an event at the Canadian Embassy. We heard from Lord Zach Goldsmith, a peer but also a government minister here in the UK and also Canada's uh, climate ambassador. And they were both saying, uh, we were, they're going to do a superb job, the UAE, we've been there recently, they're um, very ambitious on solutions, things like that. John Kerry, the US climate envoy, has also welcomed the appointment. But that's not totally surprising because after all, these are negotiations. This is a huge exercise in diplomacy, so they always speak highly yeah. of each other in public, even if they may have reservations. They may be just making the best of a, a bad job. We wait and see. Um, a bit closer to home, we've had a big announcement on farming this week and farming subsidy. Yeah, the government has finally given all the detail about, it, about how it is going to pay farmers and make, in the form of subsidies and other rural payments. And they are now going to incentivise them to protect nature and meet climate targets alongside also producing food. This is the thing, ever since we left the EU and they had their cap payments, which broadly encouraged production, We've now moved away to encourage more wildlife and carbon storage, is that in there too? Yes, that's right. So now farmers will be incentivised or they'll be able to claim, claim payments for things like planting wildflowers, uh, boosting hedgerows, managing woodland, in the more radical end of the spectrum, actually transforming their land away from farming into things like woodland, although that doesn't always go down well, that idea with farmers. Um, so it's a, it's a very positive step. There's a long way to go. Yeah, and, and it's very controversial, especially when it comes to what we do with our land. That is something we will be looking at probably next week. Victoria, thank you very much. Now, time to get one of your questions answered. Here's Mike via the website. Heat pumps are more popular in colder countries than in the UK, yet I still hear people say they will wait for hydrogen boilers instead. Should I hold out for hydrogen, he asks. Well, for an answer, we turn to Jan Rosnow, Director of European Programmes at the Regulatory Assistance Project, a clean energy think tank. Thanks for the question, Mike. You can install a heat pump today, uh, which will already reduce the carbon emissions from your heating immediately. Heat pumps are tried and tested technology. They're widely used in Scandinavia because they're so efficient. And it is actually highly uncertain whether hydrogen will ever be available for home heating. And the government and industry do not expect there to be much hydrogen for at least another 15 years. So waiting for hydrogen to come and save us is a risky strategy. It's a bit like waiting for teleportation, whereas you can take the train today. 
And all independent analysis shows that hydrogen would be more expensive and much less efficient than heat pumps. So if you want to reduce your emissions today, the best thing you can do is to install a heat pump. And if you have a burning question about the climate or environment, scan the QR code on the screen right now and we'll do our best to answer it on the programme. Now, for over four decades, the RSPB Big Garden Birdwatch has given a snapshot of the nation's bird populations, mapping steep declines in some favourites like the song thrush. It's happening over this weekend, and we've been with Maya Rose Craig, a young birdwatching enthusiast who reveals how things are changing. Hi, my name is Maya Rose Craig. I am 20 years old, and I am a very passionate bird watcher as well as an environmental campaigner. There is a mallard over there, um, just sort of hanging out on the ice. I come from a family of very obsessive bird watchers. That's how I got into bird watching. My parents and my older sister used to take me out. I have definitely noticed the impact of the changing climate on our bird life. The time of year when birds are migrating has started shifting, they're getting a bit more confused because the temperature and the weather just feels a bit off to them. This is causing problems because birds very often wait until there's a real surge in terms of food resources and that's when they decide to make their nests and to breed and then a second winter essentially comes in and it is really badly affecting bird populations. Personally I've always loved doing the RSPB's Big Garden Bird Watch. I think it's such a nice easy way to engage with nature in the outdoors and I think it really makes you slow down and realise what you have locally even if you live in more urban areas where you maybe feel like you don't have much wildlife. But there's also such an important piece of citizen science of people coming together and figuring out what exactly is going on with our bird population. In the winter, especially when it's getting really, really cold, it is really important that we're helping our bird populations and one of the main ways you can do that is just by putting food out. But also, birds having access to water is really important. Sort of maybe putting out a bowl of water that you make sure doesn't get iced over it makes a big difference for your local bird population. There are so many fantastic urban green spaces that you can go and visit. And one of the reasons that I personally love birds so much is because they are literally everywhere, um, whether that is the middle of the city or the middle of the countryside. Now, before we go, just a reminder that you can catch the Daily Climate Show on weekdays at 3.30pm here on Sky News. And you can get all the latest climate and environmental news on the Sky News app and website or by scanning the QR code on your screen right now. And that's it from me this week. We'll be back at the same time next week to talk about all things land and how the way we use it is changing or maybe should change. <laughs>